Evening, citizens, and thanks for tuning in to Nindy Nation. I'm Jeff, and today on episode 195, we're checking out the best new indie games releasing on the Nintendo Switch eShop this week. Click like and subscribe if you dig these weekly Nintendo Switch indie rundowns, and let us know in the comments or over on Discord which of the following games you're most looking forward to. These are the 10 new notable Nindies hitting the Nintendo Switch through Sunday, November 5th. Before we get started, an apology. Every so often, I get comments from people who find it annoying when I act like an idiot, using loud sound effects, obnoxious vocal modifications, you know, that kind of stuff. Well, please accept my sincerest apologies, because on Halloween, the week kicks off with Headbangers Rhythm Royale. And, uh, well, it's a zany multiplayer party game with a gimmick! With that gimmick being, um, drugs? If you get the references, this game is kinda like Fall Guys if it was built around the gameplay of Rhythm Heaven. You and 29 other players jump online as... pigeons? I think they're pigeons. And compete through four rounds made up of 23 different minigames. They're simple music or rhythm type games like bouncing to the beat or memorizing patterns, and at the end of those four rounds, the last pigeon standing wins. The team at Glee Cheese Studio found critical acclaim with their last release, A Musical Story, and now the pendulum has swung to the complete opposite end of the rhythm game spectrum because this thing just looks downright ridiculous. In a good way. Thankfully, publisher Team 17 had the wherewithal to add crossplay, so there should be plenty of people to play online with, but unfortunately, you can only play online. There's no local multiplayer. It releases for 20 bucks, and um, I don't know. What do you guys think about this one? I, for one, am looking forward to it. But holy crap, not as much as I'm looking forward to Wednesday. I don't even know which one to start with. The Behemoth, best known for the must-play beat-em-up Castle Crashers, first found success with Alien Hominid, the colorful run-and-gun that released as a Flash game on Newgrounds way back in 2002. Since then, it's made its way to every device with a screen imaginable, and this week finally comes to the Switch as Alien Hominid HD. Sitting somewhere between Contra and Cuphead, this game is stylish, hilarious, and plays like a dream. Now, it's hard as balls, don't get me wrong there, but whether you play on your own or team up for local co-op with a buddy, Alien Hominid is a game that everyone with a tolerance for punishing 2D action needs to check out. And you can do so when it comes to the Switch for only $11.99. But the new game in the series is the one I fell in love with over the summer when playing the Steam Next Fest demo. And I think a lot of you are really going to dig Alien Hominid Invasion when it releases the very same day for $19.99. The short version is that Alien Hominid Invasion is a co-op run-and-gun platformer with procedurally generated levels, roguelite mechanics, and RPG elements! So you know I'm sold. I guess this is what the kids call an extraction game, because you and your squad pick a level and get dropped in with a specific task. Defeat X number of enemies, retrieve an item, survive a horde, and so on. And once it's complete, you make your way back to the waypoint to get beamed back up to your UFO. However, the longer the level goes on, the harder and more intense the action gets, which helps you level up and grind currency, so there's incentive to stick it out as long as you can. Afterwards, you pour your XP and currency into various upgrades and wash, rinse, repeat your way through the story, unlocking new characters and such, which only furthers the awesome replay value I saw out of just a couple of levels in the demo. I had no idea this game was releasing this week until I started writing this episode, and I think it might be my last big anticipated Nindy of the year, so you can bet I'll be picking up both of the Alien Hominid games as soon as they drop. Maybe we'll stream them too, so keep your eyes peeled. Real quick, there's a couple of games I think many of you may be interested in, but in my research, I found they are not good. Ninja or Die is a fast-paced roguelite where you dart around doing all kinds of ninja stuff by pressing one button. Apparently, it is way too hard, 
overpriced, and has inconsistent artwork that makes it difficult to see what's happening on screen. The other one is Enchanted Portals, otherwise known as But we already have Cuphead at home, sweetie. And I don't think I've ever seen such universal disdain for a game. Apparently, the sound design is horrible, the gameplay feels bad, and the randomly generated levels create all kinds of problems in a game that's supposed to be about precision action. Maybe one or both of these will turn around with a future patch, but everywhere I looked, these two games were consistently panned across the board. So at least for now, it seems like it's best to stay away. <coughs> And then a couple smaller titles I'm still on the fence with include Alpha Particle, a passive obstacle avoidance game by Function Unknown and East Asia Soft for $9.99. You play as a defenseless particle that must make its way through 60 trap-filled levels by setting your own traps and using 10 different abilities to outrun everything that threatens your very existence. It released a couple of years ago on Steam, but has zero reviews, so... I don't know exactly what to make of it. It looks clever, if nothing else. And the other is Fusion Paradox, which just so happens to be an isometric twin stick shooter with procedurally generated levels, roguelike mechanics, and RPG elements. Visually, it looks like it was built in Minecraft or Roblox, but the colors and particle effects do a good job of giving it its own unique flair. You're exploring a maze-like space station where some kind of research has gone wrong, and you've got to stop the bad guys from doing whatever it is that they're doing that could probably end up destroying the world or something. It's published by Sometimes You with a 20% discount for $7.99, and it's developed by USANIC STD, which is certainly a name. I'm not expecting brilliance here, but for eight bucks, it looks like it could be worth a shot. Then on Thursday, November 2nd, this week's Big Thursday drop kicks off with the highly anticipated follow-up to Pathia Studios' early 2019 release of My Time at Portia. Back then, Portia was praised for being a colorful, even charming take on the post-apocalypse, where you're tasked with rebuilding your father's neglected workshop by farming, crafting, and battling your way through caves and dungeons. The biggest criticism the game received was all around its poor pacing, where the fun parts didn't last long enough and the boring parts lasted way too long. But otherwise, it was pretty well received. This week, alongside PM Studios, they finally release My Time at Sandrock, which initially released to Early Access in May of 2022. And so far, it seems like they've listened to player feedback and spent the last year really making this the worthy follow-up Porsche fans have been waiting for. With a major upgrade to the visuals, this Wild West-themed sequel now uses a bit more of a third-person perspective and features a huge cast of characters to help guide your quest and give it more structure. You can customize just about everything in this game, and you're on a quest to help the desert town of Sandrock reclaim its long-lost title as a hub of technological innovation. Machinery and other complicated gadgetry are a big focus this time around, and the third-person mix of melee and gun combat will help you fend off the local gang of outlaws when they try to stop your mining expeditions. Back in Sandrock, the gameplay is still all about building up your town, but now has much more focus on developing relationships with the townsfolk. It all culminates in quite the ambitious title, and we'll find out this week if it's a jack-of-all-trades or a master of none when it releases for $39.99. And you know, I'm not sure if you've noticed this as well, but Pixel Heart has really become a steward of retro games that not only play on the Switch, but often actually play on retro consoles too. And I've been paying a lot more attention to them as of late because their games are usually very well ported and include a lot of features we don't often see in similar titles. They round out the big Thursday drop this week with FX Unit Yuki, the Henshin Engine for eight bucks. And while I have no idea what that means, I can tell you that it's based on a webcomic by Sarumaru and developed by Saru Pro. 
As an homage to 8-bit games, gameplay is split between 2D platformer and horizontal shoot-em-up stages, with each being a clear homage to specific levels from Castlevania, Adventure Island, Mega Man, and even the underwater level from the first NES Ninja Turtles. Music is great, the pixel art is gorgeous, and there are multiple endings tied to multiple difficulties. For some reason, I've been all about these short retro titles recently, with Retro Revengers, Astabros, and hell, even before writing this, I was playing Mega Man 4. So for 8 bucks, I just might be picking this one up too. There's two games releasing on Friday, November 3rd, and since I know which one I want to end with, Rataleka is going to move out of their usual last game of the week spot, and we'll just touch on Amabili right now. As soon as I saw the little collectible gems and the enemy death animation where they fly at the screen, I knew we were looking at the latest $5 release by Juliana Lima, the solo developer who happens to be one of my favorites in Rataleka's rotation. He's got a knack for fun weekend games, with some of my favorites being Mages and Treasures and Super Sunny Island. Amabili falls in line with the latter of those two as a 2D platformer about a girl who fights through 101 levels using her guitar to defeat monsters. If you happen to be on the hunt for a quick, cheap retro fix, I'm sure Amabili will fit the bill nicely. The last game releasing this week is one I've had my eyes on for a long time now, and it's a great option to consider as we head into the holiday season. Ebenezer and the Invisible World is, if you can't tell, based on A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens, though it takes place after the events of that story. I've put a couple of hours into the game so far, and it's just the kind of hack and slash metroidvania I dig being very traditional, but full of what I love about the genre. Casper Malthus and his private guard are seeking power from a dark spirit, and good old Ebenezer needs to team up with the ghosts from his origin story to save Victorian-era London. As you can see, the game uses hand-drawn artwork, and I happen to think it does an outstanding job of making each screen feel like a real, living place. I will say I've noticed some very slight performance stutters, which the art style makes more noticeable, but I was warned ahead of time that the team at Play On Worlds has already rolled out a patch and is just waiting for Nintendo to certify it. The notes I read through appear to address every nitpick I have, and it will likely be live by time the game releases to the eShop. Regarding the gameplay, you get all kinds of combat and movement abilities just like you'd expect from this kind of Metroidvania but you also have magical abilities which come in the form of your ghost friends who appear, help you out, and then vanish. And if that rings a bell, yes, it is very much like Ender Lilies, but this time around, Ebenezer has plenty of attacks that he can do on his own, too. Coming from a newer indie team, I was really surprised at just how fleshed out the game's systems and features are, and I can tell there's a ton more to discover. The narrative takes itself very seriously, which is a bit of a juxtaposition to the lifetime of family-friendly renditions I've been exposed to, but it is very well done and captures the essence of A Christmas Carol while being its own thing, too. It releases for $19.99, which is certainly reasonable, and while I plan to poke around more once the patch is live, I kinda wanna save the game for Thanksgiving break, once I'm, you know, all in the Christmas spirit. The only thing holding me back from giving this game a full recommendation is being burned from similar promises by the ghosts of Nindy's past. However, this time I have had a chance to see what is in the patch, and have no reason to think the game won't run just fine after a couple of minor tweaks have been made. So stay tuned, because I definitely will dive back in and share my thoughts over on the YouTube community tab and on Discord, and assuming everything pans out, I look forward to seeing how this story ends. If you can't tell, I'm pretty optimistic about old Ebenezer. What about you? Gonna dive into some alien action? Build your own town in my time at Sandrock? Gather some friends for a headbanging pigeon party? Whoa, that did not come out the way I meant. Anyways, let me know down in the comments or swing over to our Discord to chat about it more. Next week, we've got the long-awaited Salt and Sacrifice leading the charge, but I gotta say, 
There's this game called Excessive Trim that I think the first line of its description tells me everything I need to know. Wreak havoc through backwater farmlands as a pothead alien with a buzzsaw flying saucer. So, uh, I guess we'll just have to see what that's all about next week. Because citizens, we're all done for today. Thanks so much for watching, liking, subscribing, and sharing Nindy Nation with others. Until next week, I'm Jeff. This has been Nindy Nation episode 195. And remember, no matter what type of game you're looking for, Nindy Nation will be right here to help you find just the thing to keep your Joy-Cons synced.